line and the projector. You're live. Let's go, great. So welcome everyone. This is, I think, the first uh, in-person event for the Robotics Institute seminar series. Uh, welcome to the audience in person and welcome to people joining uh, live from, uh, from YouTube. Um, so our invited speaker today is Mo Chen. Uh, Mo is an assistant professor in the School of Computing Science at Simon Fraser University, uh, where he directs the Multi-Agent Robotic Systems Lab. Uh, he is also a CIFAR AI Chair, an AME Fellow, and an NCRN Distal, uh, Distal Fellow. Mo, Mo is well known for his work in safety critical systems, reachability analysis, safe control and reinforcement learning for both single and multi-agent systems, as well as visual navigation and human-robot uh, interaction. Mo's research is uh, characterized and very well known for uh, the development of principled and rigorous uh, methods for safety with provable guarantees for robot behavior. He completed his PhD in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences Department at UC Berkeley in 2017. Uh, and he received his Bachelor of Science from, uh, in Engineering Physics from UBC in 2011, so, uh, which is sort of the analog of uh, engineering science at, at UFP, for those of you who know that better. Uh, from 2017 to 2018, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the Aero Astro Department at Stanford University working with Marco Pavone. Uh, and on a personal note, he doesn't know this, but uh, his colleagues from Claire Tomlin's lab at UC Berkeley, uh, when I talked to them, multiple people told me that Mo has been their favorite person to work with. And they, they did this without any prompt. So, you know, okay. you should work with Mo. <laughs> uh, and it is a pleasure to be hosting Mo today and uh, for, for what I'm sure is going to be a very thought-provoking talk. So, Mo, floor, floor is yours. Thanks so much, Florian, for the, such, such a great introduction. Okay, so I think you maybe talk, already talked about some of my slides. <laughs> uh, okay, so, yeah, so I'm Moshe from SFU. I'll skip the introduction uh, since Florian gave a such good one, but I will talk a little bit about kind of the scope of work that we do at, uh, at my lab. So first, we, we work a lot on control. So here, um, safety verification. So how can we guarantee that some robots will behave safely under certain assumptions? Um, uh, particularly, there's some computational challenges with it, with safety verification, so this is something that we focus on. Um, we also do multi-agent control naturally, and also system identification. Um, so here, kind of drawing a Venn diagram to kind of uh, imply some overlap, right? So we also work on machine learning. Uh, a lot of it is reinforcement learning, and we look at problems of data efficiency, generalization, multi-agent learning, and also visual navigation as well a lot of times using control to kind of improve these aspects of learning. And finally, uh, I also, we also work on human-robot interactions. And a big part is human intent inference and also human-robot modeling. So um, again, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, there's a lot of overlap with machine learning and control as well. Right? So today, there won't be time to go through everything, so I'm going to focus more on just these highlighted topics. So I'll talk a little bit about the computational challenges of safety verification, um, talk about how control can help with data efficiency, as well as uh, just diving a little bit into multi-agent reinforcement learning. Um, it's a very recent work that we, we, uh, that we began. Okay. okay, so basically I'll cover just these three topics, roughly speaking. So let's get started with robotic safety verification. Um, so some background first. So the tool, I mean, there are many, many tools we can use for safety verification. We're most familiar with what's called Hamilton-Jacobi or HA reachability analysis. So the problem setup is pretty simple. I'll, this won't really turn into a lecture about, about reachability. Um, okay, so a typo here, unfortunately, but here we have the, we usually assume a model, right? So this diagram works like this. We have assumption over here. So we assume some model of a robot, and we assume some, what, what we call a target set, and a target set is usually something that we consider unsafe. Um, and then by this black box for now, well, we solve this Hamilton-Jacobi equation, and then what we get as output is gonna be the reachable set. And the reachable set uh, is the states, set of states that lead to danger under the worst case assumptions. Um, at the same time of computing these reachable sets, we can also obtain the optimal controller to avoid danger. So the diagram I like to use is if you're riding a bike on some bumpy road, um, and you want to avoid crashing into this tree depicted by the red circle, then you would have to steer away early enough 
right? And the idea of early enough is quantified by the visual sense. Okay, and we, of course, we also try to take into account uh, disturbances such as the bumpy road. So I think this, this is pretty much all you need to know. Uh, there's some math mathematical details. Um, for in terms of sets, we represent them implicitly using uh, the sub-zero level set of functions. This is just a convention. And then once we solve this equation, we would obtain what's called the value function. And many of you are probably familiar with value functions. Right? So after we get the value function, the zero sub-level set of the value function represents the visual set. Okay. And then there's some connections between the value function and the uh, what we call the cost function, which represent the target set. But instead of going through all of that, um, all we need to know for now is we solve some equation, usually on a grid, and then we can obtain, we can go from L to B. Right? That's kind of the high level understanding that we need. And solving everything on a grid is kind of the issue here, right? Well, I mean, there are some benefits for sure, but the main issue is that um, as you get higher and higher dimensional state spaces, so X is a state, as the dimensionality of X goes up, we have exponentially complex we have exponential computational complexity. So this is something that we're looking to address. Okay. So just to recap a bit, so we would like to compute the reachable set. Basically, reachable set means if you want to avoid collision with the other car in this diagram, we should stay away, we should stay outside of the reachable set. Um, there are also many other uses of the reachable set. Uh, you, can set you can set up the problem differently depending on what you want to do. Right. So for example, you could also say, okay, we want to reach some some goal, let's say while avoiding something else, um, and then we can still compute the, the corresponding visual set as long as we set the problem properly. Okay. So despite some of the disadvantages of doing computation on a grid, um, the advantages that we get here are that we can account for disturbances. Right. So if, if I just go back a little bit, you'll notice that um, you can see some things that look like max, min, min, all kinds of optimization that look intractable to solve. But it turns out that if you're doing dynamic programming on a grid, none of that matters. It's all very easy to solve. Okay. Um, similarly, nonlinear dynamics is easy to account for. Right? We're just doing dynamic programming on a grid. And because we're representing these sets implicitly, we can represent sets of any shape. Right? So you can kind of see these seemingly arbitrary shapes here that we can represent. So there are many methods of trying to address the, dis the disadvantages, mainly computation. Um, there have been methods for dimensionality reduction. Um, a lot of times people will, uh, will decompose, let's say, a multi-agent into many smaller systems, or even decomposing a single large system into many smaller systems. Um, but today I'm gonna go from a different direction. I'm going to go from the kind of optimization of dynamic programming from a software perspective to see um, what if we just use brute force? Can we just simply speed up the computation enough so that we can solve slightly bigger problems? And once we can, once we can use brute force to solve slightly bigger problems, then when we combine it with the other methods that do dimensionality reduction, then um, I mean these two really complement each other. Okay. So as I mentioned, grid-based dynamic programming very expensive in high dimensions. Um, so can we kind of use software or maybe even hardware optimization to solve these problems more quickly. Right? If we can, we can then analyze higher dimensional problems. We can also enable some real-time applications for some of the smaller problems. Okay. So before we get there, I'll just uh, very briefly talk about the computer memory pyramid. And this is kind of essential for us to speed up the computation. So your computer actually has many levels of memory. Um, roughly speaking, at the lowest level, we have things like hard drives where you have permanent storage. As you go up, you get to the main memory, the cache memory, which is actually inside the CPU, and also register memory also inside the CPU. Um, the details aren't too important. The thing is that the faster the memory speed goes, the higher up you go. However, the higher up you go in the pyramid, the smaller amount of memory you have. Right? So ideally, when we do computation, we want to do computation somewhere up here. But, but then that's also difficult to do because you can't fit as much data in there. Right? So how can we um, kind of achieve a balance? Right? So uh, for us, the most important part that we're going to consider is the cache memory. So this is inside your CPU. Um, you may only have, uh, it's kind of measured in megabytes instead of gigabytes with, uh, with a RAM. Okay. 
So let me just give you an illustration of this. So, so over on the left, we have a grid, and then, as I mentioned, with the reachability analysis, we're doing these computations, we're doing these dynamic programming computations on a grid. Right? So we, we as roboticists, think of the, the coordinates as 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on, in a two-dimensional or even higher-dimensional way. But on the memory, everything is 1D. Right? And what, what happens when we try to uh, do computation is that suppose that we're accessing uh, element 0, 0. What happens is that a lot of the neighbors of this element will get automatically copied into the cache, the CPU cache. And this is kind of by design because mostly speaking, when we access some part of the memory, it's very likely that the program will also want to use the neighboring parts of the memory. So this is kind of designed into the CPU. So that means that, okay, if we load this, uh, this grid point in, we, we would also have very, very fast access to all of these other grid points. And now if you think about doing things over a grid, you're kind of thinking about for loops, nested for loops, right? You're going to go over the rows and then columns and so on. Um, so now, if we look at this picture, you realize that, okay, maybe the order that you do the for loop in is actually important. If you go this way, you can very quickly access some things that are already loaded into the cache. If you go down, then maybe you only get to do this once. And then once you go down to this point, you have to kind of flush the cache and then copy a bunch of copy a bunch more information into them. Right, so this is a very simple idea, um, but it turns out that, as you will see a bit later, by taking this into account when we do kind of iteration over the grid, we can get a lot of computational speed. So this is the first idea that we, we used. Um, the second idea is pretty simple, parallelism. Instead of doing iteration just over, like, let's say, uh, using a single for loop, we can just do iteration over multiple parts of the grid. And then if we do them at the same time, can go twice as fast or however many times as fast. Um, one trade-off to keep in mind is that uh, when we try to do, let's say, a parallel for loop, we need to load everything into the CPU cache as well. Right? So in the modern CPU architecture, you have different caches on different parts of the CPU. But uh, I think this will actually become a limitation. Sometimes you may not be able to parallelize as much as you want just because you run out of cache. And the limitation is now the cache not really how many how many things are, that you're computing at once. Okay, so we tried this very quickly and you can also use the toolbox that we developed called Optimize DP. So this is well, kind of a standard benchmark in reachability where we use the Dugan's car example. So this is the same example that you guys saw with the bike avoiding the obstacle, right? Um, so this is a three-dimensional problem. So we're kind of seeing computation times maybe in one to two orders of magnitude faster than the state of the art. And then we've been using this toolbox to, um, to do some much larger computations that used to be intractable. So we're looking at the six dimensional underwater vehicle. Um, a lot of math here, that's not important. The, the only important thing is that we're now able to do these high dimensional computations. And we've also been looking at some simplified, uh, simplified dynamics of the human work world. Right? So the idea with this toolbox is that um, now if we can do 6D or 7D computations, we can now hopefully use, combine this with other dimensionality reduction techniques. If we can reduce something from 12D to let's say 6 or 7D, right now we can use this toolbox. Whereas previously, we were kind of limited to three or four dimensions, in which case you, uh, sometimes we're not actually able to reduce dimensionality as much. Okay, so that was kind of a very, two very simple ideas. The order of the for loop, as well as just doing things in parallel. Right? I think you guys are probably familiar with that. Um, so the main issue, so, so how can we go faster, right? So as I mentioned, um, so let me just bring the parallelism up here. Right? On a CPU, CPU is kind of, you buy the CPU from some hardware store and then you install it, the CPU will, will work some way, and then you're kind of restricted by the way that the CPU works, right? So, um, so one of the trade-offs here is that if we want to parallelize, we have to use a lot more of the cache, right? If you want to parallelize, let's say, threefold, 3x, three you, you need to use three times the cache. Um, so that turns out to not be very efficient. So here I'm actually showing like a kind of a cross diagram, and it's because with the partial differential equation that we're solving, we're always computing gradients. And gradients are always kind of taken by um, taking the upper neighbor minus lower neighbor divided by the difference between them in values. So 
maybe some of you are familiar with that. So if I wanted to compute the gradient here, I need to use all the bit points here and so on. Okay, and then we have this CPU limitation with the cache. Right, so, so that's why I kind of looked at uh, using FPGA. So FPGAs are kind of like a it's kind of like a CPU that you can program much at a much lower level, and you can control all the memory access um, on an FPGA. So what you can do is, if I look at this, maybe I don't have to parallelize it this way. I could in parallel compute these three good points at the same time on an FPGA. So now I can get a lot more parallelization without much increase in the cache usage. Right, so just for two more bit points that I, that I need to store in cache, I can parallelize three times. So that's much, much faster than doing that on the CPU. Okay, so I know I'm skipping a lot of details here. Um, uh, so yeah, but I, I do want to get to the other two topics soon. So now, uh, having implemented things on an FPGA, we have um, kind of put that to the test. So here in this situation, we have some we set up some obstacles. So everything here is in the Vicon room, but just to simplify the problem. So we have this car that is driving around. Um, so a student is actually remote controlling this car. And, and the car doesn't really know the environment until the environment changes in real time. So once the environment changes in real time, we do the reachable set computation in real time as well. So, and we're doing this in four dimensions, keeping track of the x, y position, the direction of the car, as well as the speed of the car. So previously, um, this kind of uh, this kind of competition would have taken hours to do, but now we're able to do it in real time at five hertz. So the student is driving the car, trying to crash it into one of these obstacles, and the second student is trying to kind of lower more obstacles or move the obstacles around just to get in the way of the car um, on purpose. Right. At the same time, we have this FPGA running to always be computing the which was in real time. And you can kind of see that the car is always able to avoid all these obstacles. Okay. So that was kind of the control part of the talk. Uh, so now I would like to move on to some reinforcement learning plus control. And here I have some questions for you guys as well. So, uh, maybe let's see if you guys have any thoughts. But just to get everyone on the same page, just wanted to quickly go over the basics of RL. So here in RL, we assume that there's some underlying Markov decision process. Um, it works kind of like this. So we keep track of the state, just like we do in control. We have actions, and the state and some action together will kind of give us the probability of probability distribution over the next state. That's our dynamics or transition operator. Um, a lot of times, we assume that this is unknown or maybe even unused in model free R. We have some reward uh, and then some policy. So overall it looks like it looks like this from a state. We apply the policy to get our action distribution. And then the state and the action will follow the underlying MVP dynamics to give us the distribution of the next state. And so on. Um, so the problem in RL is basically so given the MVP with state space some state, state, some state space, action space, dynamics, and reward function, can we maximize the expected return? Right. I think many of you are probably already familiar with this, but I just wanted to kind of uh, revisit this very quickly. A lot of times the policy is going to be parameterized by some parameters theta, um, often a neural network. So today we're going to be, I mean, there are many ways you can do R, right? Today I'm going to focus mainly on policy gradient methods, including actor critic, um, just to give you guys, again, a very quick recap. So the way it works is that we define this thing that we're trying to maximize as J of theta. And then what we do is we now apply the policy. And initially the policy is random. We apply the policy to obtain many, many different trajectories. And then using these trajectories, we can estimate the gradient of the uh, of, of j. So here, the one over n sum from sum from one to n. That's basically like a sample based empirical mean. And then we evaluate the expression on the right. And if we have enough samples, then this hopefully will be a very good estimate of the gradient. And once you have the gradient of j, you can always go. You can do gradient ascent on j in order to um, get better and better returns. 
Okay, again, I think probably many of you already know this. Um, I do want to draw your attention to the two key things inside here. One is the R of tau i, so this is the return estimate of, a, of your trajectory. Um, and, and many of you probably know the different ways of estimating this, right? They could do TD lambda or, or Monte Carlo, for example. And then the second part is going to be the baseline. So together, some people will call this the advantage function. Okay. So I think the baseline is actually something that we're going to be focusing on. And the main idea here is that um, the main idea here is this return estimate is telling us how well a certain trajectory is doing performing some task. But this idea of how well is kind of arbitrary in some sense, right? How well compared to what? Right? It's kind of like when you're playing a video game, maybe you think you got a pretty good score, but did you really get a good store, score? How do you know what's good? Right? So we kind of want to compare with some baseline comparison. And that's what the baseline is doing. Okay. So, yeah, so, so this gradient, as I mentioned, is actually a estimated using samples, right? So inherently, the estimate will be noisy. The more samples you, you have, so the more data you have, the better you, you, the better you will be able to estimate this gradient. Um, and then the baseline function in RL is usually used to reduce the variance. What that means is that um, if you have a good baseline function, you will be able to have a good estimate of the gradient of J with fewer samples, right? That's kind of what reducing variance means. And some very popular choices could be the average return of the last few episodes. So if you're playing a video game, it could be your, your score in the last 10 games. That could be the baseline of comparison. Um, a lot of times people use the value function. So the value function kind of tells you how good you should be doing from every state. Right? So if you have a perfect value function, that will be similar to comparing your game scores to the high score. Right? Um, okay, so I think maybe hopefully many many of you many of you are familiar with this so some questions that we've been thinking about right so do better gradient estimates always lead to better policies uh, this may sound a little strange but if you think back to the first part of the talk when we're doing dynamic programming right um, you can kind of so when we do dynamic programming we're always guaranteed to get the globally optimal solution but whenever you use any kind of gradient based methods you're always kind of traveling along the the landscape of the the reward, the return, and the cost function. Right, so, so we already know from machine learning that gradient-based methods may not give you the best solution. Right? So in RL, we spend a lot of effort trying to get enough samples or reduce the variance enough so that the gradient estimate is good. Right? But is that really the only things we care about? Right? Um, so that's kind of one question we have, and we don't really have an answer to this. Just something that I wanted to throw out there. Right? Maybe when we do your research, you can think about this question. The second question we've been thinking about is, can the baseline do more than just reduce variance? Because like, to me, a baseline seems more fundamental. If you're kind of going back to the example uh, of if I play a video game and I get some score, and I, if I have a good baseline of comparison, it doesn't seem it doesn't it seems like there's more to it than simply reducing the uh, variance, right? I'm not putting it very concretely, but this is kind of just food for thought. And, uh, so following these two questions, we kind of started to investigate this a little bit. Right, so can we use control to provide a good baseline? Okay, so let me explain a little bit. So the idea is that, okay, maybe we can solve a simplified version of the problem using control. So let's say that you're flying a quad rotor, and that's a very difficult problem that maybe control alone cannot solve. But what if we simplify that problem to something that control could actually solve? And maybe if the problem is simplified enough, we can actually find a solution using control. Um, and then we can use the solution from control as a baseline. Okay, so we get some value function from the lower dimensional solution, and then we use it as baseline. And the main point isn't really to get a very good solution. The main point is to provide some kind of global guidance to the RL problem. Right? So when you do control, even if you do control on a very simplified problem, um, maybe the details are going to be wrong because you've simplified the dynamics in the environment. Right? But, but the overall idea of you, you fly from, maybe you need to stabilize the quadrature first, and then the quadrature needs to tip one way to fly a certain direction to the goal, that kind of idea is going to be still captured by the simplified problem, even if the details of the torques, let's say, 
are kind of missing. And that's kind of the idea. And uh, in some cases, uh, we also test some special cases, and it seems to lead to more accurate gradient esti estimations um, with small amounts of data. Okay. So now, a bit more concretely, so what we do when we solve a simplified version of the problem is we use some approximate dynamics to, to our problem. So, and the dynamics would be very, very, maybe very approximate in some sense. So for example, let's say that you're doing um, navigation using LiDAR, right? So let's say the state space would be the LiDAR observations. I'm gonna be using the state space and observation space kind of synonymously, right? So the LiDAR dynamics are gonna be very, very difficult to model. But if we knew that the underlying system is just a car light system, then we could actually write down some approximate dynamics for the car based on the internal states, right? And then we would have access to all of this information in simulation. So now with this very simplified dynamics, uh, we can use either dynamic programming or MPC or whatever control technique you want to, uh, to obtain some form of low dimensional value function. And this value function tells you from every state, at least from every low dimensional state, how well should you expect the agent to do. Right? That's kind of what we want. That's kind of what I think of as global guidance. And this, uh, this low dimensional value function can then be set as the baseline for the higher dimensional RL form. Okay, so it's gonna hopefully provide reference for rewards collected during the simulations or experiments. And then intuitively, um, again, it provides kind of some kind of global guidance because control will be able to explore the low dimensional version of the problem very thoroughly, right? So we have some guidance everywhere in the state space. Um, there's gonna be some details with the mapping between the states as you can see, we have the, for the baseline, we need the high dimensional state, but the value function only has a low dimensional state. Um, the simplest case is if the low dimensional spa state space is actually a subspace of the high dimensional space, then that's not too difficult, right? Maybe we can set the remaining missing states, high dimensional states to be zero, or to be any state. Um, in the case of LiDAR, we can also do some kind of LiDAR measurements. A lot of times in simulations, we have both the low dimensional and high dimensional state spaces. So, I mean, there's some details here to match, this, match the states, but it's not, it's not too bad. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. It's a very simple one. Get some value function using control, uh, and then set the baseline in RL to that value function. So we kind of tried this for several problems. Uh, the first one was just getting a turtle bot to navigate using LiDAR in this, environment, in this cluttered environment. So the turtle bot starts in the green part, and then it tries to drive to the yellow part without collision with the oxygen. So um, by just running PPO, we kind of we couldn't really we couldn't really get a very good solution. The turtle bot kind of hung out at the bottom part, kind of going in circles, sometimes colliding. Um, but using a baseline uh, from control, whether it's from dynamic programming or MPC, we can we can kind of see that we can learn a lot faster because um, that's that kind of because the control already knows that you could get to the goal. Right? When we solve the control problem, we know how the car can get to the goal, even if we don't know how to get how to get there using only LiDAR. So when we're training using RL, if the robot starts to move around in circles here, we know that's bad because compared to the baseline, it's bad. Right? So that's kind of a that's kind of the idea. So another kind of environment, we have this quadrature trying to fly from the green region up to the yellow region in a very cluttered space. Um, so here we can see that. The blue line is the just purely using PPO to learn. And the quadrature basically learns how to hover very quickly. But then it was having trouble going all the way to the right corner. It had a tendency to kind of uh, tilt to left, go up to the middle, and then just keep, keep going to the left. But with a control-based baseline, um, well, that's going to tell the R wisdom, OK, that's actually bad, right? If you're simply hovering or if you're just going to the left, that's bad bad compared to the uh, baseline that we thought of control. This kind of uh, alleviates a lot of the exploration needed, right? In RL, we don't necessarily need to have any successful samples up here, because we've already explored everywhere when we solve the control problem. Yes. So then we kind of decided to try, try, our, uh, try our idea on this contrived 
uh, contrived experiment. So we have a quadrature starting here, and then we have a goal which, in which the quadrature will get 1,000, so a very high amount of reward. But then to get here, it needs to actually squeeze in between the obstacles. So it's kind of a hard task. On the other hand, we have this, maybe you can call it the landing pad, where if the quadrature simply crashes over here, it's going to get 100 reward. So the idea is kind of just to create, a, create an example where maybe if we use pure RL, the, the agent would be very happy crashing here every time and get a kind of reasonable reward. And maybe the agent wouldn't have much incentive to get all the way up here because it's going it's to crash into these obstacles. So we try that. So we can kind of analyze what happens when we do training on the, using the plot on the right. So in orange is kind of uh, the, the method that uses the control-based baseline, and then in green is the pure, purely learning-based method. Okay, so, and in the solid line shows how often the agent gets to the goal, and the dashed line shows how often the agent gets tricked into simply crashing into the trap. So with a purely learning-based method, we can see that very often, um, so that's kind of the trap rate, so very often the kind of the agent increasing, increasingly prefers to just fall down to the trap because it doesn't really know that there's something better due to the lack of exploration. And I mean, sometimes it does get to the goal, but not not so often. Whereas with uh, with our method, which kind of guides the exploration using control, we can see very quickly we have a very high uh, chance of getting to the goal and a very low chance of getting to the trap. And so we know that when we fall to the trap, that's bad. And it's bad again according to the baseline provided by the control. We also kind of looked at the, the accuracy of the gradient estimate here. So in so one is perfect estimate of a gradient. So we're comparing the gradient to the true true gradient here. So it turns out that in this particular example, um, by using a good baseline, by using the baseline from the control, um, which is shown in blue here, we're able to actually get a better estimate of the gradient compared to simply uh, estimating the uh, the gradient using just a typical. By using the value function as the, by using the value function from RL as the baseline, I would say this result may not be so generalizable to every to every case. But in this particular example, we do get a much better estimate of the gradient. Okay, so that's the second part, kind of using control as a way of providing some kind of global guidance to R. Right, and the two main questions I, I, I kind of I asked, which is kind of what the questions that led us to to this work, was Maybe you guys, we can all think about this. Do, do better gradient estimates always lead to better policies? I think to some degree it does, but maybe it's not the only thing that matters. And can the baseline do more than just reduce variables? I'm not sure, but we're kind of looking into it now. It's kind of a very preliminary work. Okay, so now moving on to some multi-agent RL. Okay, so, so, so here we're actually looking at multi-agent hierarchical. Yeah. Do you do different questions at the end or no? Oh, we can take questions now. So I was wondering, this is a very interesting way of providing model-based uh, you know, uh, data uh, estimates of the value function uh, in a policy gradient method. But uh, th there are also methods that try to, uh, to put it in the Q function estimation. So estimating the critic with uh, some uh, model free data and some model-based data. Uh, what would you say would be the, you know, the advantages and disadvantages of those two uh, approaches? Yeah, yeah, so um, there's definitely, I would say, there's pros and cons, but I would also, yeah, so I think maybe the main difference is going to be the globalness of the estimate. So with our method, we get a global kind of, we kind of explore the space for free in some sense. With the other methods, you still have to do some exploration. For example, if you're using guided policy search, you still need to explore the right areas to get a, uh, to get a good estimate of the base. Um, that's the main. I think that's the kind of the main benefit. I would say these methods are not really mutually exclusive. I, I think we can. I think they are complementary to each other. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Maybe for the first two parts of the talk. I should have stopped in the first part. <laughs>
Okay, so we can keep going and then more time for questions at the end as well. Okay, so multi-agent hierarchical RL. So this kind of the motivation here is that I, I think, I, I, I can't represent every human, but maybe we think kind of hierarchically. We make some high decisions, maybe I'll head to the door, and then our body will kind of do low-level execution in terms of, let's say, how to get there, right? And then when we have multiple people in the room, or maybe in multiple robots, and if we're all thinking hierarchically, we're going to be asynchronized. We're not all making decisions at the same same time step, which is kind of what RL is doing. A lot of times with multi-agent RL, um, we kind of assume that at every time step, we have to take an action. And then, but in reality, I kind of, I think it's a little different. I think maybe, Maybe everything should be hierarchical. Each robot or each agent is deciding on a high-level goal. That's the decision it's making. But then not every agent is always making a decision at every time. Right? So this is the motivation for this one. Um, for for motivation example, we're imagining a conference menu. Whenever they start again, I think some of you may be going to Acra, which would be nice. Um, so imagine a conference menu with three water dispensers. Maybe you bob in there. There's some tables with some water. Everyone drinks from the water. And the water level stochastically goes down as people drink. And here we're kind of imagining that there are two helper robots. Um, one slow ground robot that is going to drive around to different water stations to fill the water. And then there's going to be a fast scout robot. So let's say a drone. It's always scouting around, flying very quickly to see where the ground robot needs to go next to fill the water. So this is kind of a, a scenario that we're imagining. So, so the way we wanted to approach the problem is in a hierarchical fashion. So instead of thinking about what actions to take, we're thinking about what's called options. Right? So, so instead of turn left, turn right, go forward, and so on, we would like to think about the decisions being navigated to table A. So we're calling that an option. And every time a robot chooses an option, that is going to induce some set of actions that will perform the, that will complete the option. So none of this is really new, but uh, I'll just uh, give a quick overview. So the so let's say the slow slow ground robot may be making decisions to navigate to table A, and that may take five seconds. You know, once it's there, it's gonna make another high level decision, serve food, and that takes two seconds. And then it's gonna make another decision to go to the door, and that might take five seconds. And then maybe at the same time, the fast flying robot is making its own series of decisions high-level decisions, and all of them are going to take a different amount of time to complete. Right? So maybe navigating to table B will take just 2.5 seconds, and before the slow ground robot is finished navigating to table A, um, the fast flying robot is making another decision. Right? I think you probably get the idea. Okay, so now if we kind of go back to the policy gradient estimate, you kind of note that everything is being summed up at every time step. So that works really well when every agent is synchronously making the decisions. But what happens when the agents aren't really making the decisions synchronously? Right, so that's kind of the, uh, the problem that we're considering. Turns out that there are some really trivial ways of dealing with this. So one way is if agent two has already finished the previous option and then needs a new option, so needs to make a new decision, we can simply have every agent make the decision again, right? So every time any agent finishes uh, performing the previous high-level decision, every agent will now pick a high-level option. So that's one way. Um, another way is we wait for the slowest agent to finish executing the option. And then every agent together synchronously uh, make a new decision. So, so we weren't really happy with this. Obviously, this is not too difficult to do. So then we ask some questions again, right? Again, I, have, I don't really know the answers to these. Um, so maybe some, some questions for everyone to think about. So is there a framework in RL to, to be used to train agents in a hierarchical but asynchronous way? Well, actually, maybe we did look at this a little bit in the next few slides. But I was thinking, like, after doing this work, we thought that, okay, maybe this framework is more general than just R. Right? This, this framework can be used any time when you have multiple agents or, or making decisions asynchronously. Okay, so let's kind of come back to the RL part. Okay, so for now, for this talk, uh, we're gonna be 
let's focus on centralized control. So when it comes to multi-agent decision making, there's many different ways that they can communicate and so on, right? For now, let's, consider, for now, let's just consider centralized control. So what that means in RL is that um, we would like to output a joint option distribution. So remember that option is simply the higher level action. So and it's going to be given by pi theta of, let's say if you have two agents, then it's going to be the joint probability over O1, option one, and O2, given the robot's joint states, centralized control. So now suppose we have this distribution. It turns out that, well, if you have the joint distribution, you actually have everything else. You have the marginal distribution, you also have conditional distribution, and so on. Um, so, so now, so that turns, it turns out that this is very convenient. So at any time an agent finishes option, we can still access the policy network, but we're not gonna output everything. We're not gonna choose an option for every agent. We're instead going to compute the correct conditional distribution. So for example, in this, exa uh, in this illustration, agent two has finished the red option, and now it would like to choose a different option, but then agent one is not finished yet. So what we can do is, maybe we should just get agent number two to apply um, pi theta of O2 given O1 in the joint state. But we don't need to stop agent one from doing its thing. We just have to condition on what agent one is doing. So this is actually very similar if you have ever cooked with somebody else. You're kind of making decisions asynchronous, asynchronously with the other person. If you finish cutting the vegetable, you're kind of watching what the other person is doing. You don't want to interrupt the other person. But then based on what the other person is doing, you decide, okay, what is the best thing for me to do now? Right? That's basically what this means. The distribution over the second agent's option or decision, given what the first agent is doing currently, and then given the joint state. Okay, so this allows everyone else to continue doing their thing. Okay, so now it turns out that uh, if we're gonna do policy gradient again, um, it looks something like this. Again, we kind of said that, okay, maybe this pi theta of AT given ST may not work so well if we're not really synchronized, right? But it turns out that there's a, there's a very trivial modification we can do, we can make, um, to make the, all the policy gradient work out. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna, instead of using this pi of A given S, we're gonna replace that with this strange looking thing. Um, so here, let me explain the notation. So UT represents a set of agents that need to make a decision at a given time. Right, so these are the agents that have done the previous option and need a new one. And then U bar is gonna be the set of agents that do not need, sorry, <laughs> too much copy pasting. <laughs> uh, so let U bar be the set of agents that do not need a new option at time t. So now generalizing the previous slide, we just need to replace this term with pi theta of the, the agents that need a new option given the agents, the other agents who don't need an option's current option, and then the joint state as well. And that can be computed pretty easily if we have the joint distribution. Okay, so basically we take the joint distribution divided by the marginal over, um, over the agents that do not need a new option, and then that's how we get the conditional distribution. Okay, so it turns out that a framework like this works in all of the other cases. So we talked about centralized decision making. Um, we also looked at partially decentralized, partially centralized. Um, sounds a little weird, but we kind of made a distinction between the two. In one case, um, in one case, the agents have access to the observation, the joint observations, while only deciding on their own option. In another case, the agent is actually outputting the joint options while only given its own observations. Um, so anyway, we're preparing a kind of preparing a paper on this, so I think once it's out, uh, I'd be happy to share the details. But I think the main idea is really, it's already explained. Um, agents are making decisions asynchronously. Turns out that that is very easy to handle simply by um, looking at the conditional distribution that you can calculate from the joint distributions. And then the policy gradients basically get changed the, the, the obvious way. Right? Just replace this pi term with the right pi term that, that has the options. It's kind of going back to the water filling task. So here we did a simulation. So the state space is visual. Uh, so here we can see a first person view of the slow robot. 
the option space consists of the low level actions. So we decided to we decided to also include the low level actions as part of the options because sometimes the robot may want to go somewhere, maybe back up one step or turn right one step, and then choose another high level uh, high level option. So the high level the other high level options include like go to table one and then fill water jug fill water jug I for the slow robot. And the reward, we had a reward that uh, kind of increased rapidly as the water level, which are shown up here, go to zero. So, so we have three water jugs, they're color coded, and then their levels actually shown up here. So we have these two robots. I guess you could see them. Yeah, we have these two robots at the bottom. One of them is a scout, flies very fast, and then another one is the slow robot who was able to fill the, fill the water jug. So, I guess it's kind of hard to keep track, but um, I usually look at the water levels just to make sure that they're not down to zero. Okay, so one of them went down to zero. Okay. okay. So it's not perfect. So quantitatively speaking, uh, so, so on the plot on the left, we show the average return, and then uh, on the x-axis, -ax how many training steps? Right? So the blue is basically the asynchronous method, which is the kind of what we proposed. The green is when we, the green curve is whenever one agent finishes uh, finishes its option, it's going to wait for the other agent to finish it, finish its option as well, and then together they synchronously make the new decision. Um, the orange curve shows what happens when you kind of interrupt the other agent from finishing its option whenever you need to decide on the option. And uh, the red one at the bottom is actually the end-to-end -end method. We, we train both agents synchronously, and at each time step, we're, we're executing the load of action. Okay, and on the right is, uh, we try different kind of information patterns for the two agents. So that includes centralized, fully centralized, fully decentralized, and so on, and partially centralized, and so all of them perform pretty well. So in this, I guess in this particular task, it wasn't that important. The information pattern wasn't necessarily what's important. The important thing is really handling the asynchronicity of the two agents. Okay. So again, still this is kind of ongoing work. Um, but I'm already kind of looking ahead, right? So we're looking ahead. So this idea of having a joint distribution, I, I think that's very a, a very useful idea. So I think you can always can apply this not only in our right? So let's say that you have human in the loop, hierarchical control. Maybe if you have a robot collaborating with a human, the robot would then be able to look at what, what a human does. And maybe, maybe the human can communicate what it's what he what he or she is doing to the robot, and the robot can then um, adjust accordingly. And I think this is actually, to me, this really um, how, how do I say this? This is really what cooperation is to me. I think as humans, humans we only see our observation, but a lot of times we communicate with others about our decisions, what we're doing, and then we kind of cooperate with each other that way. We can also model humans, maybe with hierarchical, hierarchical control. If we see pedestrians or people walking in, indoors, instead of looking at what they're doing every second, maybe we should be looking at what are the high-level decisions that each of them are making? Right? And then um, and they're all making those decisions asynchronously. Right? So how can we how can we model that? Right? Obviously, also human-robot interaction is a very similar thing. Okay, so yeah, I would like to uh, also thank my lab. So we recently, actually not so recent now, but uh, right after the pandemic restrictions were lifted, we kind of went out for dinner for the first time in a couple of years. So that was really nice. So thank you everyone. Thanks to everyone in my lab uh, for making the work possible, and thank you everyone for listening. I'll take any questions.
once the methods have converged, there also seems to have a much lower variance than the others. Uh, was this expected, or is this just a nice side effect? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good observation. So we're not entirely, as I mentioned, it's a very preliminary work. So we, so actually, we never really look at the variance very much, but I think the means kind of make sense. So I would say that the sync, sync weight in green, sync weight is basically agents will wait for the other agent to finish before making a new decision. Right, so to me, it's kind of similar to asynchronized, except that, except that there's more waiting time. Right, so it seems like if the agents are always making the same sequence of decisions, they will be able to complete the task, but then they, they just do it slowly. Um, the, the orange curve, the synchronized cut, meaning that whenever the faster agent finishes its option, it's going to interrupt everyone, and now everyone makes a new decision. So this one is performing worse, probably because um, because there are too many decisions being made. In some sense, right? Um, you don't. We kind of want to minimize to be data efficient. We need to minimize the number of decisions that we're making. If you're always making a decision, you're not there yet, and then you change your mind. If you do that too often, then that can that can make the problem harder to learn. So, I'm kind of speculating. If you have more, if you have your own ideas, let me know why this is happening. And then the the other one, the red curve is. Only RL on the low level actions and every time step. So now you're making the most number of decisions. So now is the um, so now you, you need probably more data to learn all of these different small decisions. Yeah. So one of the one of the challenges with this multi agent RL is that we don't have you know great benchmarks uh, and people are making their own benchmarks. For example. Or you know they're resorting to sort of games as a substitute for benchmarks, but for, for multi-agent, you know, for robotic systems, it's, it's a bit harder. So what what would be your recommendation for uh, you know, environments? Yeah, that's a very. <laughs> so I wish we all knew. Right? Um, yeah, for robotics, I, I agree, is very difficult. Um, honestly, I don't really have a good answer to that. So one challenge that I find with the benchmarks is that a lot of times they may not be exactly what we want to do. I think even if, even if we did have a set of robotics benchmarks, um, somebody could always come in and say, okay, maybe what I'm doing for these benchmarks don't really apply to what I'm doing. I think that's, that's part of the reason maybe why we don't have a common set of benchmarks. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know. It would be nice to... <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I don't have an answer to your question. But I guess I guess what I'm trying to ask is, uh, if you ask a uh, traditional reinforcement learning uh, person how they would, uh, you know, what would be their first experiment for hierarchical like RL algorithm, they would try the, you know, the four rooms type of environment, uh, and then they would try to scale it up to, uh, you know, to some uh, card games. Uh, but then the question is, uh, you know, what's the analog of four rooms for? Yeah, so so in a different project that I didn't show, we had we had something like this. So we had a small room with multiple robots, it was kind of a collision avoidance problem. So the idea was we have a ring of goals, and then the robots also start in a ring, and then they have to pass through the center to to reach the other stuff. So that kind of environment could be some kind of perhaps multi-agent navigation benchmark. And then the way, it's kind of like our custom benchmark in some sense. Um, we just vary the number of agents along the ring. We vary the ring size. And then we also vary the obstacle density as well. So there are some standard things you could do that way. It's kind of difficult to scale to very, very large spaces just because not everyone has a very large space. Um, yeah, I think it's hard, kind of hard with the physical, with physical robots. A lot of times, there's also questions about do you use motion capture? I feel like maybe motion capture should be one of the baselines, right? Right. But maybe not all maybe not all benchmarks should have motion capture. By the way, I'm not claiming that having a real robot experiment would be the you know the, the way to go in this uh, in this type of evaluation, right? But just an embodied uh, you know a simulation of a of a robot doing uh, high level reasoning plus low level motion by control. Yeah, yeah. 
so we we done everything in simulation initially as well. So it was all in placebo. Mm -hmm. I know not everyone is a fan of placebo. That's that's the other thing. People like to use different environments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I, I think it's something that everyone needs to kind of come together and be on. Um, there's also the issue of not every environment can. I think right now we're moving into more and more human and robot semi autonomous systems. So ideally, we want an environment that can do that. So can the human interrupt the robot? Can the AI interrupt the human as well? Like that's something that I would think should be included. Thank you. Any other questions? I can, I can hardly hear you. Yeah. We guys kind of seem to think that this plot, essentially, um, like beyond the, the, the better performance of your asynchronous solution, is that the asynchronous and waiting solution has reduced variance over time. Um, and you posited that this could be due to a reduced waiting time. And so I guess like, that would be, that should be very interesting to see is that well, we actually have a reduction in waiting time as it converges, right? Um, and then for the other one, the top one, Maybe past that down step, there's kind of an increase in the variance. Yes. Um, and is that due to the fact that you're using complex policies instead of kind of like those single step actions? Or is there a change of mode in your choice of action beyond the single step? Or is that due to something? Because again, like, it's kind of a surprising observation, but somehow, like, yes, it, the average performance gets better, but the variance is essentially worse as they should be converging. Yeah, that is a very good observation as well, right? So here you can see the variance increasing over the episodes. Uh, again, I'm really not too sure about this. Um, yeah, so this is, like I mentioned, preliminary work. For the, sometimes if we have too many low level actions, so overall my, my intuition is that if we're, if we're using a hierarchical approach, you can definitely have a variance because there's less chance to do something randomly bad in the middle. I think that's something that would make things robust. We have other, we had another project with visual navigation as well, where we use a hierarchical approach. And that one, we also saw much lower variance when we use the hierarchy versus no hierarchy. Um, there was just no chance that the robot is simply making high level decisions. There's no chance to do something small that is wrong. Right? But specifically for these experiments, I think it's definitely something we need to look into more. Yeah, so great observations. <clears throat> so when you were showing the comparison between the our policy gradient and the policy gradient with the control baseline, yeah, uh, yeah. you were showing always two uh, yeah two curves for the MPC and for the dynamic programming. I was just wondering um, what did you change here from like the red MPC and the purple MPC? Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, so for both dynamic program programming and MPC. We had two different versions. So one version is exactly as I described. We compute the low-dimensional low value function and then use that as a baseline. The, the second thing we do, which is actually theoretically wrong, theoretically wrong, was we took the value function from low-dimensional control problem, and then we also used that to initialize the not just the baseline but the value function of the R outside. So theoretically, that's not correct because the value function is supposed to be attached to some policy. So if we take the controls, if we take the value function from control and use it for, as the value function for the RL, well, initially, initially for RL is using a different policy, so that value function should not be valid. Um, we're now looking into can we initialize the value function and the policy as well, all from control. Right? But for now, we're not doing it correctly, but it still seems to work. And so, and, like, is the second one working better? Like, I mean, like, I'm not sure which one is which. Uh, I think the ones that are when we so I actually don't remember, but I, I I believe that uh, yeah I believe the ones that work the best are the ones where we we use the entire value function. We replace the baseline and the value function. I see. Um, but we had a we had a schedule that updated the value function as well. So as the policy changed, we also updated the value function. Oh sorry, I, I'm sorry. I remember now. <laughs> I think my student may be in the call. Sorry if, that I forgot. <laughs> okay. So for the best performing curve. Oh, sorry, for the orange and the red curve, what we did was we used the baseline function from control, and then we never changed it. 
So throughout the entire learning process, we never updated the baseline, and we always use the same baseline. And as you can imagine, when the RR policy gets better and better, that baseline is no longer the best baseline, right? Because the best baseline eventually is going to be the value function from the R. Right? So for the green and purple curves, we actually periodically updated the baseline as well. Um, we also use the value function. We use. We also initialize the value function too, which is not correct as I mentioned, but but maybe eventually, yeah. It started learning quickly, and eventually, when everything converged, then it was okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I have a question about the first part of the uh, experience with uh, uh, the cache efficiency. Yeah. So the uh, results that uh, you were showing on the um, uh, compare the uh, state of the art approach versus your optimized library, uh, did you also conduct experiments by uh, investigating? How well, how well these problems, uh, how much can you solve on GPU? Uh, is there other analogous ways to use the problems computation on GPU? Uh, how old is the goal distance of, hey, even without expensive GPU hardware, still keep this performance on CPU? Yeah, that's a great question. So what about GPUs? So the, I think one of the reasons we went to FPGA was that GPU is not completely custom, just like how CPU wasn't custom, right? So we didn't want to be restricted by the architecture. Um, for GPUs, actually before developing this toolbox, we actually developed a GPU toolbox as well using CUDA. So now in the recent benchmarks, even just using CPU, we're actually faster in the GPU toolbox using CUDA. Um, but I don't think we've done enough testing for me to definitively say that this is just, CPU is just always faster than GPU. I think that's debatable. We need to do more benchmarking. Um, for this toolbox, the focus was more on uh, ease of use. So every, so you code up your dynamics, you code up your problem in Python only. You don't really need to know any CUDA. So that was the main, uh, the main benefit of this toolbox. For the previous GPU toolbox, it was kind of difficult to work with. And we found that after we implemented it, no, nobody used it. <laughs> so even my, even the people that I work with very closely, they, they don't, they don't like to use CUDA. Just is, uh, is the most performance improvements coming essentially from the access to memory? Both yeah. Like that's why you went to FPGA eventually? Yeah, I think, uh, so So for the software toolbox, so I think parallelism is one thing, and also... Uh, oh, so which language is it written? Sorry? Which language is it written in? So this is, so for the user it would be in Python, but there's, an, uh, there's a layer called H hetero CL that translates Python code into efficiency plus plus code. That is actually running underneath. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, I presented everything about reachability, like how much could be reachability here, but we also have value iteration as well here. So, so any, just, so a lot of the, sorry, I shouldn't be scrolling out too much. Uh, a lot of the results later on when we used, we actually used value iteration from this toolbox uh, as a baseline for, for some of the RL. The RL so, for value iteration, the speed up is even much, even faster actually. We compare it to standard Python, and we're two orders of magnitude faster, like 100 to 300 times faster. Um, yeah, I think we, we have some sex, we have some speculations as to why, but I think mostly because with value iteration we're confined within one grid, whereas with the with the reachability, there's also time as an, an additional dimension, and that slows down computation. I actually think maybe this is even more valuable for something like queue iteration, for example. Just a table-based queue iteration. I think they get hundreds of times, or maybe I think we had a case of 1,000 times faster. But, uh, but you think that comes mostly from the access memory, so just not from swapping in, inside and outside the cache, the values that you need okay. nearby? Yeah, with the... Uh, yeah, that's also makes sense for why yeah. CPU would be better. None, like GPU wouldn't lead to any particular improvement if the memory structure is not larger than the interest. Yeah, so it's hard to say because VRAM, video RAM is much faster than the standard RAM. But maybe CPU cache is probably faster than that. But that. And I think GPU, so I'm, yeah, so it's kind of depends. <laughs> we have to choose have the right size and speed combination. Yeah, exactly. I mean, also eventually, it would always depend on the architecture that you're using. That's why you went to FPGA eventually yeah. so that you design like this. Yeah, exactly.
any any more questions? All right. It seems like uh, we're going to land the plane here. Uh, but thanks again, Will, for an excellent talk. Yeah. Uh, Luis, thanks. Thank you everyone for coming. It's my first in-person talk in, in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so nice to see real faces. Everything is better. <laughs>